Amen. Thank you to those who have led us so well in worship as we turn our attention to the Word of God. If you would join me in yet another moment of prayer. Heavenly Father, we are thankful for your Word. We are thankful that it is living and active. We are thankful that it has the ability to judge the thoughts and attitudes of our heart. May your word be just that. May your word do just that now. May we have the ears to hear your word. May we receive it. And may your word work in us. May it renew our mind. May it transform our hearts. May it make us more like Jesus. May it build up your church. Father, I pray that that you would take um, this time and use it. That I would not stand in the way of you speaking to your people now. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. The Apostle Peter wrote the letter we know as 1 Peter to encourage weary and hurting people scattered across a region due to real deal persecution and tribulation. He encouraged the church of the first century to stand upon the promises of God. And not only stand upon the promises of God, he encouraged the church in the first century to remain faithful to the end. To the church of the first century, he he painted a picture of what it looked like to be faithful in the midst of trials. As the modern day church, as we listen in to this conversation, may we too learn what it means to be people of faith even when the road is difficult. If you join me once again in 1 Peter 5, verses 6 through 11. We have slowly walked through in our very first week in this series. We looked at the entire passage and then we have gone back and we've put the laser focus on verse 6 and verse 7 and verse 8 and verse 9. We will now conclude this series with the laser focus on verses 10 and 11. But 1 Peter 5 beginning at verse 6. If you're ready for the Word of God, can I hear a big loud amen? Amen. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that He may lift you up in due time. Cast all your anxiety on Him, because He cares for you. Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in the faith, because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of suffering. Verse 10, And the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered a little while, will himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. To him be the power forever and ever. Amen. A few words for you on this Sunday evening, and the first is one you likely know well. God is gracious. God is gracious. He's a dispenser of grace. He passes out grace in abundance. 
If you've been around here any long, any length of time, you know I like to come up with definitions to words. Uh, grace has, has been been defined in many different ways. Every time I come across a definition of grace, I like it. Uh, for a while there, I was storing them all and adding and subtracting and uh, putting pieces together and crafting and drafting my own definition of grace. I've kind of given up on that. Um, I've, I've now grown to to like a definition of grace that's less specific. A a definition of grace that is wide open. I I now believe that grace represents anything that comes from God. It's that simple. If it comes from God... It's a visible demonstration of His grace. (laughs) If it comes from God, it comes from God who is good. If it comes from God, it comes from His goodness and also His willingness to look beyond our sinfulness. First Peter 5:10 refers to God as the God of all grace. Now, through the course of this series, I, I've been attempting to take these verses from First Peter 5 and set them in the context of the, fir- the, the whole letter of First Peter. Uh, here, at the, uh, nearing the end of the book as a whole, uh, Peter refers to God as the God of all grace. Well, what could that mean? Well, if you reach back to the beginning of the letter, you see great discussion on grace. Uh, on one level, uh, grace represents the salvation given to believers. We see that discussed in 1 Peter 1.10. This grace is also discussed in regards to the return of Christ. We see in 1 Peter 1 verse 13. You could describe that as saving grace. But if you dig a little deeper into the letter of First Peter, on another level, uh, grace represents the blessings that come from the church exercising their spiritual gifts. We see that discussed in First Peter four ten. You also see grace discussed in how God shows favor. To those who are humble. And we see that in 1 Peter 5.5. 5, right before the beginning of our passage in this series. You might call this. Sustaining grace. If you were here and, and heard my sermon this morning. I, I discussed how Jesus saves you. And how Jesus sustains you. You see that same concept in 1 Peter. In God's grace, he saves you. And in God's grace, he sustains you. He's God of all grace. But you're here tonight on Sunday evening worship. Because you want something a little more specific than that. You know, Pastor, uh, give me an example of God's grace. Well, I think First Peter 5.10 gives us that as well. Yes, he's the God of all grace. That's pretty generic. But what's a demonstration of God's grace? Well, he called you. Oh, grace, give me evidence. He called you. Not only that, 
1 Peter 5, 10 says, The God of all grace who called you, called you to what? To his eternal glory in Christ. Evidence of God's grace. Evidence of God's grace toward you. But before we get to glory, we need to speak about something else tonight. My second word to you, God uses suffering. I remind you uh, for the final time in this series that the entirety of First Peter is written in the context of suffering. If you were to flip back to the very first verses of the entire letter, he's writing to a collection of faithful people who have been scattered because of real deal persecution. That's the context of the entire letter. And then he speaks of the God of all grace. But then in the very next breath, Peter references suffering. I hope if you were reading this passage at home, you would get to verse 10 and say, and, and the God of all grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ uh, after you have suffered a little while. I would, I would hope you would pause for a minute and ask the question, how can we go from grace and then in the next breath go to suffering? I would hope you would pause long enough to ask the question, is that an apparent contradiction? Can we speak of the God of all grace and then in the very next breath uh, speak of the God that allows his people to suffer? Well, again, if we step back for a moment, we began this series with a laser focus on verse 6 that calls the church to humble themselves. And not for the, merely the, the sake of a show, not, not some sense of false humility, but we are to humble ourselves under God's mighty hand. And we're told in verse 6 that in due time, God will lift us up. He won't lift us up when it's convenient for our schedule. He's not going to lift us up on our time and our timetable. He's going to lift us up in due time. God's going to operate on God's timing. God's never late. God's never early. God's always on time. You know, lift us up. And verse 10, we get a little more detail. The God of all grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ Jesus after you have suffered a little while will restore you. Yeah, the, the suffering will happen. It will happen uh, for a little while, and then in due time, God will restore you. God will lift you up. The, the word restore has two primary meanings. It, it can get the idea of fixing something. It, it can get to the notion of fixing, repairing what has been broken. We actually see it used in that context a few times in our New Testament in reference to, to fishermen repairing their nets. It's actually used when brothers Brothers and sisters in Christ restore a fallen brother or sister. Uh, but the more frequent usage of this word gets at the idea of equipping and preparing in order to be made complete. 
I think that's what's getting at, what's getting, what Peter's getting at here. Uh, We suffer as we are faithful to the gospel. Yes, God restores us. He repairs what has been broken. But beyond that, God, in His grace, restores us in a way to ensure that believers, that the church will stand strong and firm and steadfast. That God, in His grace, actually takes the suffering that we experience it and He uses it to make us steadfast. The suffering meant to wear us down. The suffering, as we We've seen in previous verses that the devil would use to devour us. God uses to make us strong, firm, and steadfast. After you've suffered a little while, God will restore you. Your suffering will last a little while. Um, I, I guarantee you, in the midst of suffering, um, that might rub us the wrong way. Hey, have you ever been sad and someone just told you, pat you on the head and says, oh, don't be sad? Uh, have, have you ever been hurting and someone just pats you on the head and says, oh, don't worry about it, you'll get better soon? And while at first glance this may seem insensitive, but what is actually happening here is the Apostle Paul is comparing our light and momentary troubles here on earth with eternity. Your suffering will last a little while. Your eternal glory forever. He's not being insensitive. He's trying to open up the eyes of hurting people to the spiritual reality. Yes, this hurts. Yes, you were suffering for your faith. But don't worry. Don't be discouraged. This will only last a bit. And in due time, God will lift you up. And in due time... You'll experience this eternal glory to which you were called. You're suffering a little while. Your eternal glory forever is the God of all grace. Which brings me to our final point this evening. God provides glory after suffering. Suffering a a little while, but eternal glory forever. Let's talk about this glory for a moment. Back to verse 10. And the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered a little while, himself will restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. We're thinking about this. Here, here, God, He's demonstrated grace. He's called you. Where you are at this very moment, at the modern J church, you are suffering that comes from everyday life. Uh, you are also experiencing the suffering that comes from faithfulness to the gospel. It will last a little while, and then one day you will step into eternal glory. <laughs> 
I don't want to very quickly. Man, we're early. We got all times of time. I'll still go very quickly. I, I promise. I, I want to talk about glory for a moment. Peter shorthands it here. You were called to eternal glory in Christ. Let's pause for a minute and unpack that. What does that mean? A few points. First, when the believer dies, they are present with the Lord. For the believer, the one who has embraced the gospel, the one who has confessed sin and embraced Jesus as a Savior, the believer it lives and dies with this hope of eternal glory. And when you die, you are present with the Lord. We, we are told in 2 Corinthians 5, 8, to be away from the body is to be home with the Lord. In Philippians 1, 23, we are told that to, to depart the body is to be with Christ. And we remember well Jesus' words to the thief of the cross in Luke 23, 43. Truly I tell you today, you will be with me in paradise. For the believer, our last breath here on earth is our first breath in the full presence of the Lord. So, so, so glory, what's well, this eternal glory? Well, for the believer, when we die, we are in the full presence of the Lord. Also, we await the return of Jesus Christ. There will come a day when Jesus returns. I love it, um, as, as Jesus describes it in John 14, uh, 1 through 6. We know 14, 6 very well, where Jesus says, I am the way and the truth and the life. But preceding that verse, Jesus is describing his coming departure, and he tells his disciples, but don't worry. Don't, don't lose heart. I'm going away but I will come back for the church. We talk about this eternal glory. We know that the day we die, we will be present with the Lord. But we also know that Jesus is going to return. For all of us here, both of those are good news. <laughs> You're either going to die and be present with the Lord, or Jesus will return for the church. Also, we, we await a resurrected body. One of my favorite verses in all of scriptures, Philippians 3, 20 and 21, where the apostle says, but our citizenship is in heaven. And we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control will transform our lowly bodies so they will be like his glorious body. Closely related, Colossians 3, 4, when Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. So we talk about uh, this glory that we've been called to, that for the church, for the believer, when we die, we are present with the Lord. And we also have this hope, this eager expectation that one day Jesus will return for his church. And, and there'll come a day when, when Jesus takes our lowly bodies and gives us resurrected, eternal bodies. One more. And we also await a new heaven and a new earth. 
The book of Revelation speaks of the consummation of all things. On the old, it's transformed. Where the old makes way for the new. Where heaven and earth collide. And we're told there's no more death. No more mourning. No more tears. I think sometimes we, we overlook that, that phrasing. No more death. Because we know death. No more mourning, because we know mourning. No more tears, no, no more pain, because we know tears and we know pain. But there'll come a day when God makes all things new. When he makes all things right. It's with that healthy understanding of glory that Peter encourages the church experiencing suffering. God is gracious. God is gracious. And He's called you. And because He's called you, there'll come a day when you experience eternal glory. And right now you were suffering, but Peter's encouraging the church. God is using that suffering to make you strong and firm and steadfast so that you can live and die with the hope that comes from eternal glory. This passage ends in verse 11 with what we call a doxology, a formalized prayer of praise. And verse 11 says, to, to Him be the power forever and ever. Amen. Amen is one of those church words. I make you say it all the time. Uh, perhaps you don't even know what it means. Perhaps you've never given it any thought. It's actually an untranslated phrase. It's not English. We've just made the Greek word look like English. It's an untranslated phrase that means, so be it. Uh, or perhaps, this is true. Used as a declaration. When we hear something that is good, when we hear something that is true, we declare it. Let this be. So be it. This is true. This comes at the end of this passage, heard by a church experiencing suffering. And they're told, humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in the faith, because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of suffering. And the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ Jesus after you have suffered a little while will himself restore you and make you strong and firm and steadfast and after soaking all that in to him be the power forever and ever amen it's Peter along with the church saying so let it be this is true. In the midst of suffering, we praise. In the midst of suffering, we cling to truth. Let us pray.
Heavenly Father, we are thankful for your word. Uh, I pray on behalf uh, of every person here, myself included, uh, that your word would continue to echo, resonate in our hearts and minds. That, that this word that we, uh, we studied tonight would continue to work in us. That it would not fade from our minds, but may this word take root. May it be planted in us. May it be watered. May it bear fruit. Father, we are well aware that we face difficult days. May we remain steadfast. May you use these difficult days to create in us a strong church, a firm church, a steadfast people. We thank you. We recognize that you are the God of all grace. May we rest in your grace. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.